this is what you missed by being on Zoom before you. I have to click everyone in. So we have it set up that won't automatically admit people in the room. So you hear this theme over and over. So apparently the administration has lost that way that can change. Okay, so let's So the good thing about that is, is so we record these and they'll get posted up to YouTube in case you want to look up something later. Well, you get to watch me sitting here clicking at this for like five minutes at the start of it. I have no interest in going and editing things.
Well, good morning. Can the people on Zoom hear me okay and see the screen? Yeah, I can hear you. Great, thank you. Uh, so, for those of you who were Zooming the other day and now are, come on a second here. For those of you who were Zooming on Monday, now you're in class today, welcome. So I'm Walter Gavitt, the instructor, as you know, but now you can see me live and in person. That's a treat, of course. Uh, it's good to see all of you here. Thanks for being here, and thanks for taking the class. Those of you who were here in person on Monday, then you know what I'm doing right now as I'm continuing to admit people into the Zoom room. Um, that's why you hear the beeps, the bings. Uh, so, people here on Monday are Zooming today, and there's some people who've been, who are going to Zoom all semester. So, those are kind of the options. So, today what we'll do is, I will take roll again today. Um, after today, I won't have to do that anymore. They have a policy that if you don't show up the first week, then they drop you, and so that's why we have to take roll. So, I'll go ahead and do that. Once again, high likelihood I may mispronounce some names. If I do, I apologize and just please correct me. Um, and so, as I did the other day, I'm gonna start with the people who are strictly remote. Uh, so if you could just tell me if you're here or not. Carolyn Ahi. Here. Okay, thank you. Alexander Hope. Here. Okay. Jennifer Munger. Here. Erna Filpovic. Is Erna here? Conrad Powell. Here. Karen Spees. Here. And Nicholas Wiley. Here. Okay, thank you. Now let's check the people who are here in person with us today. Nicholas Hunziker. Here. Roman Kaminsky. Deshauna Meredith. Here. Brenda McDonald. Here. Blake Miles. Here. Jacob Schaffer. Here. Zachary Stevens here. Marco, well, Marco, I know Marco from the lab, so okay. Reese Wagner. Okay. All right, now the Monday people. Bailey Barber. Here. Adelaide Caskinet. Here. Matthew Cathro. Here. Um, Ezra Chambers. Here. Caleb Cheers. Here. Okay. 
Alexander, I believe it was a Foppy. Here. Did I get Here. that right? Here. Taylor Friend. Here. Anderson Anasek. Here. Jalen Holdaway. Here. And Shelby Patterson. Here. Okay. Alexa Wagner. Hello. Here. Okay. So let me try. Erna Pilpovic. And Roman Kaminsky. Erna's here. I don't um she's not like getting connected to the audio though. Okay. Thank you. There we go. I had to admit her. So sorry, Erna. You should be good to go now. All right, great. So today we're going to pick up where we left off on Monday. We'll see how far we get. And based on how far we get, that will determine if we're going to have a quiz on Monday of next week or the quiz on Wednesday. So we'll kind of see. If we get through the, the chapter today, we'll go ahead and have the quiz on Monday. If not, I'm going to push it back to Wednesday. So we'll see how it goes here. All right. So we left off on Monday. We were talking about ways to do separations of things. Remember, we talked about filtration and some other things. Um, we stopped here on chromatography. Does anyone remember why we stopped on chromatography? Isn't that your favorite? It is exactly right. It's my favorite, and I didn't want to rush through it because I love chromatography so much. So I didn't want to shortchange you guys. So chromatography is here's a simple example of it, and basically it's a way to separate things where you take advantage of chemical interactions. So you have you have some analytes that you're trying to separate and they interact and there's always a, there's always a mobile phase and a stationary phase. So in this example, they have this long tube, they're calling it a chromatography column, that's a pretty basic one. And in there they put stuff. And the stuff that's in there is called the stationary phase. You put your mixture in the top, you go through, you run solvent through, the solvent's called the mobile phase. And the analytes have interaction with that stationary phase. And by designing the stationary phase appropriately, you get selective retention. So in other words, holding things up. And so if you kind of see on the slide there, in the middle, top first, second tube, you see the three colors all together. Then as, it, as they move down, you see they start to separate. And that's what you do in chromatography, is you take advantage of that interaction. That's a real sim simple description of what's going on, but it's pretty accurate. And so what you use something like this for is you'll have a solution or you'll have a material, and you want to figure out what it consists of. So this allows you to do a separation, to pull them apart so you can pick out the different parts. Um, Do we have any chem majors in here today? No chem majors, okay. Some of you will probably switch by the time the semester's over to be a chem major after this class. Uh, and so next semester I teach a class called Instrumental Analysis. And this is one of, we, we'll do chromatography in there. So if you really wanna do chromatography, stick, become a chem major, stick around, senior, junior year, you can take instrumental with me and see, see what I would call real chromatography, not just a, uh, okay, so let's talk about energy a little bit. There's some definitions we want to have when we talk about energy and you should, you should, these are definitions you'll need to know. So energy is defined is the capacity to do work or transfer heat. 
Work is defined as the energy transferred when a force is exerted on an object, which causes displacement of that object. Heat is defined as the energy used to cause the temperature of an object to increase. And then finally, force is any push or pull on an object. So we'll talk a lot about energy, we'll talk about heat, we'll talk about all these things in a little more detail as the semester goes on. The, the two pictures on the side there really kind of help highlight what we're talking about. You see this woman's about to kick a soccer ball. And so the work that's being done by the player is her, what she's doing to kick the ball to make the ball move. Because remember we said works, the energy transferred when force is exerted to move, move an object. So in this case, she's winding her leg up, she's getting ready to kick that ball. That'll be the, that'll be the energy, work will be the energy needed to do that. The bottom one shows some water boiling, and that's a case of where we talk about heat, and that's the energy used to increase the temperature of that water. So you think about what are you doing when you boil water? You're putting energy into it, causes the temperature to go up, and next thing you know, the water is boiling. So these are some basic definitions that we're going to want to know, and we'll use it a little bit later in the semester. When we talk about energy, there are two main forms of energy. There's kinetic energy and potential energy. So let's talk a little bit about what the differences are. Kinetic energy, you can think of as the energy of motion. So it's the energy of action, the energy of doing stuff. And its magnitude depends on its mass and its velocity. So basically, how big is it and how fast is it moving? And so, we have a formula here where kinetic energy is equal to one half times the mass times the velocity squared. And so that's a formula that we can use if we know mass and we know velocity to calculate the kinetic energy. Potential energy, that depends on its relative position compared to other objects. So if someone tells you, okay, so Right now, you all have the potential to get an A in this class, right? It means you have the ability to do that. You have the opportunity to do that. That's your potential in this class. So potential energy is the same thing as potential to get an A in this class. You're in a position to be able to do it. Someone who's not in this class has no potential to get an A because they're not in the class. So no matter, it doesn't matter, they can't get an A. You can get an A because you have the potential. It's the same with the energy. On the left, you see the bicyclist sitting at the top of the hill. They're not moving, and we said kinetic energy is the energy of motion, the energy of stuff happening. So there's no, there's no kinetic energy going on there. They're just, they're just sitting there waiting at the top of the hill. But because they're at the top of the hill, what happens when you go down the hill? You're going you're gonna to go fast, right? So that tells us that we have high potential energy. If they were sitting up there on the bike and it was flat, they have no kinetic energy, no potential energy, because there's not that big hill there. Then on the, the diagram on the right, the cartoon on the right, we see the person, they've gone going down the hill now. So as they go down the hill, they're, they're losing that potential energy, right? Because they're using it. Potential energy is being converted into kinetic energy. And so they're going faster. So the potential to go fast is decreasing because they've turned that potential energy into actual energy that's being used. So that's kind of the difference between the two types of energy. Kinetic energy is stuff you're actually doing. Potential energy is you have the ability of it. You have the potential for it, but you haven't started using it. So once again, as I said, potential energy is the stored energy. And in chemistry, when we, you know, is how we're going to be thinking about it. We're not going to be thinking about it so much in terms of the bicyclist that we saw or things like that. But when we talk about it with regards to chemistry, we're usually talking about attractions and repulsions going on. And this will be at an atomic and molecular level. 
but it's the same idea as the bicyclist, right? Except we're just looking at it at a real microscopic level. One form of potential energy in chemistry is something called electrostatic potential energy. And when we talk electrostatic potential energy, we're talking about the interactions between charged particles. So in, in charged particles, opposite charges attract. So if you have a negatively charged particle, a positively charged one, they will attract. If they're both positive or both negative, they repulse each other and they don't, they don't come together. So it's kind of like, you ever hear the phrase opposites attract? That kind of comes out of the chemistry stuff. At least I like to think it does. But in, in the world of chemistry, this interaction between charged particles, and when we get start talking about it in more detail, we'll be talking about cations being the positively charged ones, anions being the negatively charged ones. But that's the basis of a lot of stuff that we'll be studying are these interactions, these electrostatic interactions. So that finishes up the first half of chapter one. Here are some homework problems that you should spend some time going through. You're not going to turn them in. I'm not going to grade them or anything. The answers are in the back of your book so you can see if you got it correct or not. But work through these. See how you do. It should be the stuff that we covered in class. Um, there are some additional examples in the book. The quizzes and tests are going to be based on the homework problems and the lectures. I'll tell you that. So if you spend some time doing this, it should make the quizzes and tests more, more doable. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about numbers and how that relates in chemistry. If you think about it, a lot of chemistry is observations. You know, you mix two things and it turns blue. You do this and, and it generates some heat and things like that. But really, as you get further along in chemistry, you really want to get answers to things. It usually involves some type of quantitative measurement of where you do whatever the experiment is and you're trying to generate data so that you can figure out what exactly is going on. So that means calculations. When we talk about numbers in, in chemistry and in science, there's some things to remember. We always have units of measurement, okay? So it's grams or milliliters or joules or some me in, uh, measurement unit. Uh, we always have the quantities that are measured and calculated. So that's the number, you have 50 mils or something like that. Uh, there's also always uncertainty in the measurement. No measurement that you make is perfect. There's variability based on the instrumentation that you're using or the glassware that you're using. There's the, the variability that the person who's doing the analysis introduces. There's always some type of error in that. So, you often express numbers as 52 plus or minus 0.2 or something like that to reflect that variability that the number can kind of be within that range. Significant figures is another thing. Does anyone know what significant figures mean? It's like the zeros before the die. Is that, is that right? So the significant figures, it's sort of right. The significant figures is based on how you did the measurement is that it tells you that you have a certain number of the numbers in your measurements that you have absolute confidence in. And we'll show some examples here in a minute, but you have absolute confidence in. And then there's the one digit in the measurement that you're kind of estimating based on the tool that you use to do your measurement. Those numbers that you have absolute confidence in, and then that first number that has that estimation built into it, those are your significant figures. Any numbers after that, you really have no confidence in. So you think of your calculator and you, you do some calculations. Sometimes it'll give you maybe eight places past the decimal point. Yeah, that's fine. But from a measurement, a chemistry measurement perspective, those digits usually don't mean anything because your measurement that you did, if you weighed something, 
and you weigh it out to be 22.4 grams, you know, you know the first two digits are really good. The third digit, that 0.4 digit, is going to have some variability in it because the balance that you used has some error in it. And that's reflected in that number. So anything more than those three digits, if you generate a number, you really have no confidence in because where did it come from? It's just the, the calculator generating it. It's not linked back to that actual measurement that you did. So that's why you talk about significant figures. You don't want to overstate the accuracy of your data. And significant figures allows us to have the appropriate expression of the data. And then finally, dimensional analysis. So dimensional analysis is one of the early things you learn in doing chemistry calculations. Um, a lot of stuff you learn early in your chemistry career, you learn, and unless you go into certain areas of chemistry, you don't really use that much ever again. Dimensional analysis, if you do chemistry, you will use every day that you do chemistry. What's dimensional analysis? Dimensional analysis is where we take conversion factors, which allow us to express something in one type of unit and get it into a more appropriate unit for what we're trying to do. You think of grams and moles as one. You think of changing volumes. You think of changing weights, things like that. So if someone said, how much do you weigh? And you said, I weigh X number of pounds. And they said, well, how much is that in kilograms? You would have to use dimensional analysis to convert that over. So one skill that's a critical that you develop and you get comfortable with, and we have some homework problems on this, is to do dimensional analysis. A lot of times when you're doing problems, if you're a little confused on how to do the problem, if you just line up the dimensional analysis stuff and don't worry about the numbers, just get your units canceling, you'll be able to figure it out. Okay, let's talk about some of the units. So at, in the world of chemistry, you hear people talk about SI units. So uh, that's the international system of units. And here are the base units that, that go with that. Length is meters. And so here's something that you should know. You should understand that meter is abbreviated by the small m, kilogram, kg, Kelvin, a capital K, on down the line. You should know that. That's stuff that you, you need to understand and memorize. Uh, so length is meters, mass, kilogram, temperature, Kelvin, time, second, on down the line, amount of substance, mole. So these are just the agreement that the international scientific community has of how we're going to express things. Okay. So in the United States, we, for the most part, don't use the metric system except when you go into the lab. The lab is all metric. And so when we're in the lab, we'll be talking, when we're talking about mass, we'll be talking about grams. For length, it'll be meter, time is second still. Temperature, for most of the stuff you guys will be doing, it'll be in degree C. When we get to some of the thermodynamic type calculations, those are in Kelvin. Uh, amount of substance is mole, and then for volume, it's cubic centimeter, which is cc or cm cubed, or it's expressed in terms of liters. So this will be the language we'll be using. We won't be saying degrees Fahrenheit, we won't be saying pounds, we won't be saying inches for the most part. This is what, this is kind of the, the way we do it in, in the science lab. Uh, it's kind of interesting in a Diet Coke can over there, you see 12 fluid ounces. I think we all know that soda cans 12 ounces. But did you know it's 355 mils? So milliliters. So you actually see that on quite a bit of stuff these days where they will have the metric on there. You just don't ever pay attention to it because that's not how we're used to expressing it. Okay, here we have the system prefixes. 
as I put in red there, you need to memorize the prefix, you memorize the abbreviation, and what it means. So they have all these in, in, in wattages. Don't worry about that part. Let's just focus on the prefix, the abbreviation, and the meaning. So the top ones, the big ones, peta, tera, giga, mega, you don't see those as much in chemistry. Where do you, where do you see giga and tera and mega a lot? Computer science. Computer stuff, yeah. You'll hear say, I got a terabyte hard drive or something, gigabyte hard drive or things like that because you're talking big, big numbers, okay? When you get into chemistry, kilo, the K, 10 to the third, kilogram is pretty, pretty common thing, especially if you do larger scale work. Uh, but where you, what you really will get in the lab, you'll get milla, 10 to the minus third, so milliliter, we just saw that on the soda can, right? 355 mils. Uh, micro for microliter, uh, nano, nanogram, picogram, things like that. So when you start looking at trace level type work, which is very common in chemistry, you get to nano, pico, micro. Those are used a lot. And we see micro is 10 to the minus 6, nano, 10 to the minus 9, pico, minus 12. So Once again, just like with some of this other stuff, these are things you'll need to memorize. One thing I will point out is down here at the very bottom where they talk about joules. So one joule, which we'll use a lot, we'll use joules a lot when we do some energy calculations. A joule is equal to one kilogram meter squared, second squared. Why is that important to understand that? If you think back to that kinetic energy calculation formula that we had. We had the kinetic energy was one half times the mass times the velocity squared, right? So what that tells us is to use that formula because the joule is kilogram, meter squared, second squared. The mass has always got to be in kilogram and the velocity has got to be in meters per square so that our units match with this. That's an example of the dimensional analysis stuff. You get those units to line up, then it kind of tells you what you need to do. So take advantage of using the units in the dimensional analysis context to be able to, to figure stuff out if you're, even when you're not quite certain exactly how to do the problem. Any questions about this? This is kind of a bit of a repeat of the other, but, but these are just some key ones that I'd like you to focus on. So giga, mega, kilo, deca, centa, milla, micro, nano. These are really the ones that you're more likely to use. Um, and it just has over on the right, the multiplier, just as we had on the table before but it just gives you a, a feel for which are the ones that are a little more common that we'll be using. Let's talk about mass and length for a moment. Uh, mass is the amount of material in an object. The SI units use kilogram, metric system uses grams as the base unit. So we'll be talking about grams, kilograms, things like that when we talk about the mass. So one thing just to remind everyone is technically mass and weight are not the same. And it's because weight by definition depends on having gravity present. And the easiest, and so you're supposed to say when you talk about uh, how much stuff is there, you're supposed to say mass. As I said the other day, I guarantee you I'll say weight sometimes, but I should be saying mass every time. The reason, the best way to think of that is, and they give the astronaut example here, but that is a good example, is think about whenever they show those, those astronauts up in the space station. What are they always doing? They're floating around, right? Or the pins floating through the air or whatever. Well, that astronaut doesn't, doesn't have a different mass than when they were on Earth, but since there's no gravity, they float around. So that's why, so if that 
That's why they say mass is what you want to use because that's the true mass of work. That's truly how much is there. It's not dependent on gravity by definition. Length is distance. We typically talk about meters as the basis. And that's where, since meter is the basis, that's why we need to know those prefixes. So if, we, if someone says centimeter, we know what that means. Millimeter, we know what that means, and on down the line. Okay, volume technically is not one of the base units in SI, but we do use it all the time, and it's derived. So uh, in the first example, they showed meters cubed, and so basically it's just the volume that's in a cubic meter. The one that you mostly use, though, in, in the chemistry world is liter and milliliter. And there we have a liter is a deciliter cube, so one deciliter on each side, and a milliliter is one centimeter on each side. So that's why sometimes you'll see, instead of it saying milliliter, it'll say cc or cm cubed. You tend to see the cc, cubic centimeter, in the medical field. So a lot of times, you know, if you're if you're in a doctor's office or something like that, and they're going to give you a, an injection, they'll say it's how many cc. Do you show that in the medical TV shows? That's what they're, they're talking about milliliters when they say cc. I don't really know why medical uses cc and chemistry uses ml, but it's the same thing. So let's talk a little bit about measuring volume and. You'll be using some of this stuff next week in the lab. So there's different ways to measure volume. So the first thing here on the left is a graduated cylinder. And graduated cylinder is, you see the little white stripes on there, each of those is some number of milliliters. And so you would measure out using this if you wanted to say 20 mils or 25 mils or something like that. Um, you also can use a syringe. Syringes are typically calibrated, so you can pull up with an exact amount and deliver that. And then finally, the third one is a burette. That burette, just as like the graduated cylinder, has markings on there for volume, and it has that little stopcock there with the arrow going to it, and you turn that, and that allows you to drip small amounts out and control that. We'll use that later in the semester when we do titrations in one of the labs. So those are all ways to deliver varying amounts. Depending upon how much you put in and measure out, you have some range of stuff you can do. They're saying that the pipette, the next one, is used to deliver a specific volume. That is normally the case. However, when you get into lab, you'll see your pipette actually allows you to do variables. It's a different type of pipette. The pipette they're talking about is you use that little bulb up there on the top to pull up a certain amount of liquid and you let it drip down. And the, the piece of glass, the pipette glass, has been calibrated to hold a certain amount, one mil, 10 mils, 20 mils, something like that. And then you would just dispense it. So typically, that's what I would call a, a more common pipette, is one that is specifically made for a certain volume. The ones you're gonna use in lab actually are variable volume pipettes. So there are both kinds of that. And then finally, volumetric flask. The volumetric flask is calibrated to hold a certain amount of volume. So on the neck of it, and you can kind of see it on there, there's a, there's a point where it stops. So there's a line, a little glass etched line in there. And then if you fill to that line, it's 1,000 mils, 50 mils, whatever the volume is that's written on there. That tells you what that is. So that's very useful when you're making up solutions because as you'll learn once again in the lab, if you take 50 mils and 50 mils, it doesn't necessarily add up to 100 mils. Okay, there's reasons for that. I don't want to spoil it for you. 
Um, and so this allows you to know that you're getting exactly to that total volume if you have a mixture of things going there. So these are just some of the ways that you can measure volume. We'll use the graduated cylinder, we'll use the burette, we'll use a pipette, we'll use volumetric glass. We'll use all of those in the lab this semester. Let's talk about temperature just for a few moments. So what's temperature? Tells you how hot it is, how cold it is. Something that we do probably every morning when we get up before we go outside. We check the temperature to see do I need a long sleeve shirt, short sleeve shirt, coat, no coat, things like that. And what we're really interested in, we're also interested in heat flow. And heat will flow from a hot object to a cold object. So though that's something we'll study in a little more detail, but that's just kind of the basic idea of what we're talking about in heat. Here we have the three temperature scales that we're, we're familiar with. We have the Kelvin scale, we have the Celsius scale, we have the Fahrenheit. So the Fahrenheit is the one that in the United States, at least, we tend to use to report the temperature. You know, you get up and you say, oh, it's gonna be 90 degrees today. You don't say it's going to be 90 degrees Fahrenheit because we all assume that that's 90 degrees Fahrenheit. If you get someone who's say from a Europe or somewhere else where metric is the norm, you tell them it's 90 degrees, they'll be in a panic because it's, uh, it's almost boiling. And we see the scales there are different. The Celsius scale and, and Celsius and centigrade are the same. It just people don't say centigrade much anymore. Uh, the, the metric scale is really good because to me, it's really easy to remember things. Water freezes at zero, water boils at 100. Zero to 100 is the range. You see Fahrenheit, 32 is the freezing, 212 is the boiling. Personally, I never remember what water boils at in Fahrenheit. I never remember that. Uh, Kelvin is just, Celsius plus 273. So you see that 273 is the same as zero C. So it's just 273 plus whatever you are in Celsius. And it says there in, in, in the chemistry world, we're going to use Celsius and Kelvin. Um, Celsius has that zero for freezing, as I said, 100 for boiling for water. So pretty easy to remember. So if someone asks you, what's the boiling point of water in Celsius? 100 degrees, zero degrees for freezing. And then Kelvin, there's no negative Kelvin temperatures. And that's important for some of these calculations that we'll do later. And the lowest possible temperature is something called absolute zero, which is zero Kelvin. And here's the formula that relates Kelvin to, to degree C. And so it's just degree C plus 273. So once again, on the, on the going back to the dimensional analysis, when you're doing some of these calculations and you're confused as to what does the temperature need to be expressed in? Is it Kelvin? Is it Celsius? That's where looking at the units and how the units cancel out will give you some guidance on which of those you need to do. Do you keep it in degrees C or do you have to add that 273 to it to make the calculation work? So, so remember that. So as we talked about before, Fahrenheit really isn't used much in, in, the, in the chemistry science world. You hear it every night on your weather report. Um, and here's how you can convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. If we, we're not going to spend really much time worrying about converting Fahrenheit and Celsius, you can you can do that if you want. Uh, but this just does give you the the relationship. So nine fifths time whatever the degree C value is plus 32. And then for degree C is the Fahrenheit minus 32 times five nine. Okay, so 
Ethylene glycol, that's one of the ingredients in anion freeze. It freezes at minus 11.5. What is that freezing point in K and degrees out? Let's think about K. How would we find out what that is in degree in Kelvin? Yeah, you had 273. You had 273 plus a negative 11.5, and that would give us 261.5. How about the F one to convert from C to F there? Well, we use our formula, 9 fifths times degree C plus 32, so it'd be 9 fifths times minus 11.5, then plus 32, it'd be 11.3. Let's talk energy for a minute. Remember, we talked briefly about joules, and it's know that it's driving. It comes back from that kinetic energy formula that we had. Remember, one half mass times volume squared. If the object is two kilograms and it moves one meter per, sec per second, it will possess one joule of kinetic energy. How do we get that? Well, if we plug those in, remember we said mass in the formula needs to be in kilograms. So there we have two kilograms. The velocity needs to be mass per seconds. And we said it was one mass per second. So if we do that math, we'd have one half times two kilograms times one mass meter per second, that quantity squared. And that gives us one kilogram mass squared, second squared. A lot of times when we talk about, about energy changes in chemistry, we talk about kilojoules. If you have a kilojoule, what does that mean? What is that, what is that telling us versus a joule? Think back to our prefixes that we, we said we're going to memorize. If it's a joule versus a kilojoule, what's the difference? Anyone, anyone have an idea? One is smaller. One is smaller. By how much? A thousand fold. Yeah. Remember the K means a thousand. So if I say KJ kilojoule versus J, that means it's a thousand joules as the K KJ. So one kilojoule equals a thousand joules. That goes back to that table that we had earlier that said here are the prefixes. And here's what that means in terms of, is it 10 to the third bigger or 10 to the third smaller or things like that. That's the importance of learning that table. So that's why I want to stress we need to learn that. Uh, calories, everyone talks about calories, right? Or you hear about it. I'm counting calories if you're, if you're want to gain weight or lose weight. Uh, you talk about calories you exert if you exercise and things like that. Well, calorie is actually a chemistry term for this, for the heat flow. And one calorie is 4.184 joules. That's just that's the old definition of it. That calorie isn't the one people talk about when they talk about food calorie. The food calorie is actually a kilocalorie versus the energy calorie. It's the same thing, same calculation, but for some reason, they left off the kill up, the K part. And instead, they make it a capital C on calorie. Personally, I find this extremely confusing, but it is what it is. Uh, the nutritional calorie you hear about is really a kilocalorie. So when we do these calculations, you'd have to get to the kilocalorie to really know what it does in terms of energy and food and things like that. So the nutritional calorie, with the capital C AL is equal to a thousand calories. There's actually, actually one of the ways that you can determine the uh, calories in something is there's, a, there's an experiment where you do, called, it's called a bomb calorimetry experiment. And you actually can 
you blow the stuff up and you measure the heat that's given off. And by doing that, that measurement real carefully, you generate the heat, the energy that's given off. And that's where these calories, you can get these calorie measurements. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of interesting. There actually is a way to generate, if you ever wondered, where, how do they know how many calories is in this food? There is a way to do it. Okay, let's, let's talk about this. A baseball weighs 5.13 ounces. What's the kinetic energy in joules of the ball when it's thrown by a pitcher at 95 miles per hour? Okay, does, any, does anyone remember what the kinetic energy formula was? It's one over two m v squared. Right, it's one half times the mass times the velocity and then the velocity is squared. Does anyone remember what the units are, what joules represents? I think, let's go back and take a look. I think we said here, one joule can be expressed as kilogram times meter squared, second squared. So, I'm looking at this and I'm a little confused here as to how that's gonna fit into that, that formula. So what would help me to get things to fit into that formula? We have a weight of a baseball, 5.13 ounces. We said here in our formula up there, KE equals one half times MD squared. We want mass, but what's our units here? For the joule, what's the mass units? Kilograms. Kilograms. So that tells me I've got to take that weight of the ball and I've got to convert it into kilograms to be able to plug it into this formula, right? How about the velocity? The velocity, they said, was 95 miles per hour. What did we say the velocity units need to be here? We said meters per second, right? To be able to plug that into our formula, it's got to be in meters per second. So if I went and plugged in 5.13 ounces, 95 miles per hour, and I just plugged that into that formula and did the math, my units would be ounces, miles squared over hours squared, right? We said back here that it's got to be kilogram, meter squared, second squared. So what it tells me is I have to use my old friend dimensional analysis to get the weight of that ball into kilograms and the velocity of the ball into meters per second. Okay, so let's look at, okay, that's just the units we want to get to. Let's see the conversion for the ounces to kilograms. So we're not in metric. We need to get to metric. So we know that one pound has 16 ounces in it, right? So if we take 5.13 ounces times one pound divided by 16 ounces, that gets us into pounds. We know that because we have ounces in the numerator here on the left, ounces in the denominator on the right, those will cancel out. This is, this is what we do when we do a dimensional analysis. And now we're into pounds. Well, pounds is still English. We want to get that into metric. One pound times one kilogram divided by 2.025 pounds. That's the relationship between kilogram and pounds. Then the pounds will cancel and we wind up in kilograms and we get to our final weight in kilograms. So now by doing dimensional analysis, we've converted that weight of the ball into units that fit in with our formula, okay? Now we've got 95 miles per hour. We wanna get that into meters per second. So let's, let's work on the numerator first, the miles part. 95 miles, there's 1.6093 kilometers in a mile. That cancels out our miles. Now we're in, now we're in metric kilometers. 1,000 meters per one kilometer. 
That then cancels out our kilometers, and now we've got that numerator of this into meters. Let's look at the bottom part where we have hours, and we want to get hours into seconds. One hour, 60 minutes per hour. We cancel those hours out. Now we're in minutes, and then 60 minutes, I mean, 60 seconds in one minute cancels our minutes out, and now we have the denominator here in seconds. We do all that math and we get 42.5 meters per second. So then once we have this, we have the 0.145 kilograms, the 42 and a half meters per second. Now we can plug into our formula, our original formula. One half times the mass, we calculate that out to be 0.145 kilograms. And then that multiplied by the velocity, which is 42.5 meters per second, that's squared. And we get to our final answer of 131 kilograms meters squared per second squared, or 131 joules. So there's several things we had to do in this problem. One is we had to get the weight of the baseball and the, and the, the speed of the baseball, the velocity of the baseball, into the appropriate units to fit into our formula, because we know our formula is based on the joule, and that's the kilogram meter squared second squared. So we use dimensional analysis to go and do those two conversions so that we would then have values that we could plug into our, our formula. If we would have forgotten to do one of those conversions, we wouldn't have gotten the correct answer. If we would have messed up one of those conversions, we wouldn't have gotten the correct answer. So there, were, so there were a few things we needed to do to, to get things lined up to be able to use the formula. So one half mv squared, pretty simple formula, right? It's not a real complicated formula. But to use it appropriately is the trick. You can't just take the numbers if they're not in the right units and plug them in. Uh, any questions on this? Um, excuse me, I had a question. Okay. What is... What does E subscript, subscript K stand for? That's kinetic energy. Ah, okay. So the, e, the energy is the big E and then the K is the, tells you it's kinetic. Okay. Thank you. Sure, any other questions? So this, this idea, you know, in, in, in chemistry, there's often a formula to explain something. And then you have to learn how to apply that formulation, of, uh, that formula appropriately. One of the real keys to it is the unit thing. And everyone is guilty of this, is when you're writing stuff out, you always want to leave units off and things like that because it just, just quicker. I would strongly encourage you to not do that. When you have the units and you can kind of line up units to see if they're matching and they're canceling out appropriately, kind of like we did here, it just greatly increases your odds of doing the math right, not getting you know, one of the fractions flipped or something like that. So it may take you a little bit more time and a little bit more writing to put that stuff all in there, but I think it's really helpful to write this stuff out, especially earlier in your chemistry career. Um, I've been doing this a long time and I still mostly write the units out because it helps me keep things straight. It's real easy to get stuff flipped or get confused and putting those units in always tells me, yeah, I got the, I got the problem lined up. Maybe I'll make a math mistake and that's a different problem, but at least I'll know I have things lined up correctly. Okay, let's talk about a physical property, density. Let's go back to Monday for a second. Is density an intensive or extensive property? Does anyone remember what an intensive property is? Remember inten intensive, had the I's in the definition. What was one of the I's? Independent, right? 
So the intensive property was independent of how much stuff you had. The extensive property was dependent on how much stuff you had, right? So density. Density is defined as the amount of mass per volume. And so the, the, the common units are grams per mil, or they'll call grams per centimeter cube. Remember we said centimeter cube and mil is essentially the same thing. So if, if I'm saying density is the amount of something per volume, does that number change if I have a little bit or a lot? Or does it stay the same? If it stays the same, then it's an intensive property. If it changes, then it's extensive. Any, any guesses here in the room or online? Intensive? Intensive, is that what you said? Yeah. You're correct. Because whether I have a small cup of something, okay, I could weigh that, I could weigh that amount and I could measure how much volume it is, that's going to be the same as if that ratio, because it's a ratio, right? That's going to be the same as if I had a whole bunch of it. And so density is an intensive property. And you see over here, there are some densities of some materials. Um, water is one. That's the one you usually are, are familiar with. But ethanol, you see, is less dense than water, about 0.8. Um, and you see some other things, some of those are solids, obviously. Uh, but ethylene glycol, water, ethanol, those are all liquids. The others, I believe, are all solids, yeah. So density is really a good property because a lot of times you can get a feel for what something is just by its density. I think we have an example, yep. So here they're telling us that we have a bottle of something that's a clear liquid. We think it's benzene. Um, that would be bad because benzene is very hazardous and any more rarely found in labs for that reason. Uh, and so they took 25 mils of this. We measured out a known volume and they weighed it and got 21.95. So what would be the density? How would we calculate density for this? <clears throat> uh, D equals M over B. Mm -hmm. So what were the units for density? What did we say the units for density were? Yeah, the units we said, the most common are grams per mil, right? So that tells us that we need the weighted grams, we're good. 21.95, and we need the volume in mils. We're good, 25 mils. So we're ready to do the calculation because our units are all set up for us. We had that baseball example. We had to do a bunch of conversions to get to the units lined up for that formula. Here we're good to go. So if we take if we take 25, 21.95 grams divided by 25 mils, we get point. 878 eight grams per mil. They're telling us that in the literature, someone has measured the density of benzene and found it to be 0 0.8787. So do we think this is benzene? Yes. Yeah. So this is an example of you could use a pretty simple measurement. Measuring density is really easy to do. You can, you can literally just weigh it out by volume. I mean, measure it out by volume and then weigh it and then do this calculation like we did here. They also sell things called density meters, which are even easier. You squirt like about a mil in and tell you what the density is. Um, and that's why the literature value has four places. The density meters almost always give you four places. Let me ask you this, why do we only have three figures on our calculation? 
How come we don't have four? It's like the approximate. Is that right? Well, like the significant figure. what data did we what go back to the question part and what are the two numbers that we use to calculate that? We use 25.0. How many significant figures are there? Three. And then the mass you said was 21.95. How many significant figures there? Four. Four. Because the 25.0 only had three significant figures, we can only use three figures in our final answer. Okay? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit here, but I just wanted to point that out. I should have had 25.0 in my little calculation. I got lazy there and left out the point oh, so sorry. Don't be lazy like me. Okay. We're gonna talk a little start talking a little bit about error and things like that. So you see a lot of numbers in science. There's something called exact numbers. And that's where you assume, even though we say there's errors and everything, we just assume we don't factor any error into these measurements. And the example they give is 12 eggs, there are 12 eggs in a dozen. Okay, so we don't, we don't worry about significant figures on that. Uh, inexact numbers are numbers that we actually do a measurement. And this is what I was saying before. Numbers that we actually have to figure out, like, like the measurements, not just the definition, have some error to them because whatever was used to make that measurement has some variability associated with that measurement. No measurements are perfect. And then on top of that, there's each of us, we have some inherent error in each of us when we do the measurements. And that combines to give you a little bit of variability in that measurement. So once again, we talked about this before, but I want to repeat it because it's important. Measurements have three components. The number, the unit, and then what it is. So, and as we keep saying, there is uncertainty in all measurements. So examples of this is 150 milliliters of acetone, 500 milligrams of aspirin, so we have the numerical quantity, 150. We have the unit, mils. We have, what is the stuff? Acetone. If you're in a lab and you leave one of those three things off when you're identifying a, a chemical, you have a problem. If I tell you, if I give you a, a jar of liquid and I say it's 150 mils and hand it to you, that's not really very useful to you. You're thinking 150 mils, 150 mils of what? If I tell you this is 150 acetone, you're gonna be like, well, what is that? Is that grams? Is it mils? Is it leak? I mean, what, what do you, what's going on here? That's why you want the amount, the volume, and also what it is. So when we talk about uncertainty of measurements, it really depends on the accuracy of whatever device you're using to, to make the measurement. The last digit is considered pretty good, reliable, but it's not exact. And here on this temperature reading, they show us an example. So we look at this and we see that because of the graduations on the thermometer, we can tell the difference between 25 and 30 pretty well. But in between the five and the zero, we're kind of guessing, right? We look at that and whoever did that measurement says they think that's about 27. I don't know, it might be, or it might be 26. Probably not 28, but you see that's where that, uncertainty comes in. So here, that first number, if we say it's 27, we're pretty confident of that too. The seven, someone else may read it a little bit differently and think it's an eight or a six or something like that. So there would be some error introduced there in the measurement. So if someone used this thermometer and told you it was 27.4, 
you should say, there's no way you can tell me that because you, if you don't have it, it's not designed to give you that level of accuracy. <coughs> here's, a, here's a really good example here where they're measuring the quarter. So the top ruler, what's the difference between the top ruler and the bottom ruler? They're both rulers. They're both 12 inch rulers, it looks like, or 12 centimeter rulers. A measurement, there's an extra three on the first one. Yeah, but just look at the ruler. Don't worry about the number, just look at the ruler. What's the difference? One showing millimeters. Yeah, you got all these extra marks there. So someone has gone and calibrated it to show you these, these smaller divisions, what they are. The bottom one, you see, they're, they're saying it's 2.3 centimeters. Well, once again, like we saw in the thermometer, that 0.3 thing, I don't know. I look here and I think it looks more like 0.4 to me. You know, it, but it's subject to interpretation by the analyst. The top one, because it has those millimeter markings in there, tenth of a centimeter markings, we're pretty confident that it's 2.3, right? So the first one's more accurate than the second one. Yeah. That? Because see, you're getting three significant figures. You're getting the first two, 2.3. We know those are good. I think everyone would agree it's 2.3. The second three on there, like I said, you're making an estimate. So maybe you may have some differences of opinion there. The bottom one, we know it's two, but after that, we're estimating that. So you have those first digits that you're certain of, and then the last digit, that's where there's some variability in that based on who's reading it and things like that. So this is an example of you're measuring the same quarter, but by having a little bit better ruler in the top one, you get a better measurement than you do on the bottom. This happens all the time in the measurement world. Uh, how good of an instrument do you have to make your measurement? That'll, that'll reflect how good that number is, how accurate that is. In this case, does it matter if it's 2.3 or 2.33? Probably not. That quarter's still gonna fit into the vending machine when you wanna get something. But, you know, other times when you do these measurements, those kind of differences are real important. Okay, you always hear people talk about precision and accuracy. Someone will say, we gotta be really precise. Yeah, you know, precision isn't the one you worry about usually. Precision just tells you how many measurements, if you did a series of measurements, how well do they agree with each other? So you can be extremely precise and totally wrong. Accuracy is the one that you really are interested in. You'd like to have them both, but accuracy is really important because accuracy tells you how close are you to what the real value is? So precision is just, if I do the same analysis multiple times, do I get the same number every time? Accuracy is, if I do the analysis, do I get the right number, the true number? So when you do experiments, you often do more than one replicate. And you do that just to kind of get a feel for how much, what your precision is, of how reproducible it is, or did you make a mistake, things like that. The dartboard example has been around forever, but it's a really good example of accuracy and precision. If you, if you assume you're trying to hit the bullseye, the top one shows you all the darts clustered around that bullseye. Well, if the true value that you're trying to hit is the bullseye, it's great accuracy because they're right around that bullseye. If you say precision is, if I repeat something multiple times, do I get the same answer? That's got good precision because all of those darts are right there clumped together. So that's an example of, a visual example of accuracy and precision. If you look at the next one, all those darts are right next to each other. That's great precision. Whoever threw those darts could hit the same spot every time. But if you were in a dart game, that, that person wouldn't be getting points for the bullseye because even though they were really precise, their accuracy was off. They missed the point. 
And then finally, down at the bottom one, you see the darts are kind of spread out, and I don't think any of them are in the bullseye. So that's where you have poor accuracy and poor precision, and you really got a problem. When you have that poor accuracy, good precision, that's often called you have a bias. And so usually you can examine your experiment and figure out what you're doing wrong and correct the bias. So it's good to be precise because if you just have a bias, you can usually do something to correct it and figure out what the problem is. But this is the difference between accuracy and precision. You want them both. You want to be precise and accurate. But accuracy is really the one that tells you if you're getting the right answer. Okay, scientific notation. We saw some of those tables where we have, you know, 10 to the third, 10 to the sixth, 10 to the minus six. So we know we're going to be working with wide ranges of numbers in terms of really small numbers, really big numbers. It gets hard to write those kind of things, and that's where scientific notation comes into play, to write expressing these big and small numbers in a manageable way. Um, scientific notation means you have the decimal part and you have the, the exponential part. So you'll have like 2.4 times 10 to the fifth, something like that. The key thing is you'll need to use your calculator to do those types of calculations. There's not, there, there will be some subtle differences in how the calculators actually operate. So one of the things you'll do in the lab next week is you'll have some examples of where you have to use your calculator to do some of these type of calculations. It's really important that for your calculator, you know how to work it in scientific notation. Because when you're doing your calculations for the test or the quiz or whatever, you're going to need to be able to do it with your calculator. And so, you know, I may or may not be able to help you with that. Depending on what calculator you have, I may not know how to use it, or I may, it just depends. That's why for you, it's best to take some time, get familiar with those keys on your calculator so that you can, you can do the calculation. This is just some examples of the scientific notation. 10 to the third would be 1,000, 10 to the second, 100. 10 to the zero is one. Sometimes people forget that. Um, 10 to the minus one is 0 0.1 and on down the line. Okay, so when we talk about scientific notation, we're talking about moving the decimal point around on the number to get it between one and 10. So you write the decimal part multiplied by 10 raised to the number of places you move that decimal around. If it's a positive exponent, the number is greater than 10 and you've slid that decimal over to the left. If it's a negative exponent, the number is less than one and you scooted that decimal to the right. Let's take a quick look at an example. So if we wanted to express the first number in scientific notation, so 0 0.000232, what would I do? Would I scoot that decimal? Which way? To the right? Yes. To the right or left? To the right. How many would be scooted? Three. Three, if someone said? Or four. Four. Because if we scoot it four, and we just click. We scoot it four, one, two, three, four. Then we get to 2.32 times to the whole four, minus four. So since we scoot it to the right, that exponent is a negative. How about the next one? 4,531. How would we write that in scientific notation? Three to the left. Three to the left, yep. So once again, we scoot over, puts it between the four and the five, and we get 4.53 times 10 to the third. So once again, this will be something that, that you'll want to do. Uh, and we see on the top one there, going back to the significant figures, we see zeros when they're like that between the decimal and the first number are not significant. And this is one way to tell these significant figures. If you convert to scientific notation, you see those three zeros drop out of the expressions. 
Okay, so I think we're going to end now to give you guys a chance. One of the things I will ask you to do is to take a wipe and cloak and wipe out down your thing. Before you leave, because we didn't get through the material of the chapter today, we will not have a quiz on Monday. We'll have it on Wednesday, okay? Everybody get that on the Zoom call? No quiz Monday. The quiz will be Wednesday. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.